What I'm going to talk about is what that experience was like, really, teaching economics from a pluralist approach, what I thought that meant, and um, what we've actually included in the course, and also maybe a little bit about what it's going to be like changing economics more widely and where the sources of resistance are likely to be, because I think I've experienced that in microcosm within my own, within my own school. Um, it was very nice that, that Wendy ended with that super tanker because I was telling her before she started that I actually came back from Brazil <laughs> about a year ago and I was actually on a super tanker and um, it actually turned around within its own width and I was absurdly <laughs> cheered up about that. <laughs> Although it has nothing to do with anything except that you can turn a super tanker around extremely quickly and they're fantastic for doing that. So all that stuff around how difficult it is is a load of nonsense, at least as far as the super tanker is concerned and that's quite cheering I think. Um, so I think I'm going to focus a bit more on what it's actually going to be like to make this change, which I think we, we urgently need to make in the way we think about economics. Um, I'm a bit less confident than Wendy about the importance of, of modelling, and um, I'm not convinced that we'll ever be able to model the economy effectively, because I think it's just extremely complex. I've got one PH, PhD student looking at, at modelling just one economy from a complexity point of view, and... I don't know how far she's going to get with that, but there's so many variables. I, I'm a bit doubtful about that, and it makes me question more widely what sort of a discipline economics is. And I think that's one of the questions that I hope you're raising. And I certainly see economics sitting there in the social sciences. I think that's where it belongs. And so I think that does raise questions around to what extent models are relevant and to what extent people who can't work with models should be allowed to become economists. I think it's, it's an important question. I think they may have important insights, even though they can't cope with the modelling and the maths. But uh, something I completely agree with Wendy about is the importance of data. And I think um, one of the things that's gone wrong with economics is that it's worked with unreal models rather than real data. So when I started teaching, I had a real problem because I, I, I didn't feel able to include anything that was like a made-up example with made-up numbers. And an awful lot of what we do, especially when we're teaching first-year economics, is just making up numbers and including them in a model. And I just felt really uncomfortable around that. But if you don't do that, how can you possibly simplify the world enough using real data to be able to, to um, show students any of these kind of models that, that we normally use? I think it's, it's quite an important and difficult issue, especially in the universities that, you know, where people don't have the same kind of grades as they do at UCL, and also when you're teaching people in the first year. Um, okay, so here's Alfred Marshall. In the eighth edition of his Principles of Economics, Alfred Marshall wrote that economic conditions are constantly changing, and each generation looks at its own problems in its own way. And um, the trouble is we haven't really changed very much what we think economics is about since Alfred Marshall wrote that. But the problems we're facing have changed massively. You know, particularly in terms of our awareness of the ecological crisis and I think also in terms of global inequality. As a generation, particularly you younger people, you know, you're, you're facing these problems throughout your whole life, but the failure of economics is that it hasn't changed, I think, to take these, these problems seriously. And this is why it feels very urgent and why I'm, I'm really glad that Wendy and her team are doing what they're doing. And what I think we need to do is, is find ways to spread that more widely so it becomes completely unacceptable to teach economics in the conventional way where it just doesn't apply to the, the problems of today. Now here's um, the famous Gregory Mankiw who has already been referred to. Last time I taught the first year economics course I had to use this book because I didn't control the subject myself. And it was, it was embarrassing. I found it actually embarrassing having to use this book. I think one of the worst things was when we had to, to make a, dis, you know, people were making choices between ice cream and frozen yogurt. And actually, at this point, I'd never, I don't, I've still never tried frozen yogurt, but I didn't even know it existed. And it was, and I thought, well, what about if somebody's using this textbook in, in India, you know? Or I just felt kind of embarrassed that I was part of a discipline where the textbook focuses on something that's that's so culturally specific. And the frozen yogurt is just a trivial example of that because I think the whole discipline and the whole textbook was shot through with with culturally narrow ways of seeing the world. Anyway, the reason Gregory Mankey is here is um, because of this quotation where he says, we still have to teach the bread and butter issues. And then he lists the, the, the main issues of a standard core economics textbook. And I mean, I'm, I'm just not convinced by that, really. They will remain the bread and butter of introductory courses. And as I say here, you know, this is the bread and butter. He's selling the textbook. But what he stands for is a whole institution of economics and how it's understood and how it's taught and this is really what we're up against and you know we have to be realistic about that we have to be 
political about that, I think, about what it's going to be like to change the way economics is taught. And in a very small way, I found this in my own very tiny economics department. Um, because what's made people uncomfortable with teaching economics is in, in a new way is that they no longer have all the answers. If you make a subject about questions, there are some questions you can't answer. And the people, I mean, obviously, I, I mean, I'm a question and answer person. I don't need to feel that I understand and know everything. I don't need to feel that I have access to arcane knowledge in order to justify my place in, in the teaching situation. But I'm afraid some of my colleagues do. And I think it's quite common amongst economists that they rather enjoy that sense that they have this mystery and nobody else understands that. And once you start subjecting the discipline to open questioning, their power sort of disperses. And that's very frightening for people like Gregory Mankiw, I would suggest. And in a way, that's a challenge we're going to have to resolve. Because if we're going to get economy, I mean, obviously, we could just wait till they all die and train people better. That, <laughs> but I mean, we haven't got that much time. So we're going to have to deal with these people. And we're going to have to take their kind of personal challenges in terms of changing how they teach economics seriously and, and find ways of solving them. I don't really know why I've got the Queen here, just because it's nice to have her on my side for a change, I suppose. Um, so, I mean, certainly I think in Britain, I think this was a kind of, quite a crunch moment, really. I don't know what Wendy thinks about this. It certainly was in terms of the public debate. Oh, my God, even the Queen can see what's going wrong here. And, you know, a letter was written explaining the failure of this collective imagination of many bright people. Um, but I don't feel that there was any serious response by the very people who should have been predicting the economic crisis. I mean, here, here is the Queen questioning why none of the economists saw the crisis coming, and I don't think there was an adequate answer to that question. Incidentally, not long after this, uh, not long after the Queen raised this question, I, was, um, I met Princess Anne because I, um, well, because she came to open a, a social enterprise that I was involved with. And I also set up a local currency in, in my community of Stroud. And um, somebody gave Princess Anne one of these Stroud pounds. And so then she, she kind of turned to me and said, oh, how does that work? You know, and I was just like mortified. So I kind of responded, oh, it's actually a bit complicated. And then so she said, um, oh, I hope it's not too complicated for me to understand. I thought, oh, no, I've really put my foot in it now. But anyway, that, then she said to me, she, she basically gave me a, a concise and excellent explanation of how the financial crisis had happened and why the, a local currency might be a good response to that. And it kind of blew me away, I've got to admit. And I thought about them all sitting around at Sandringham or wherever they go on their holidays, kind of discussing the global financial crisis and actually probably understanding quite a lot more about it than... Um, oh, I don't think I need to go over that one. Quite a lot more about it than, than some of our students do. So here's a way of thinking about the change we need to, to bring about. Once, once we start questioning the conventional paradigm of economics, it seems to respond by saying, OK, well, we'll have a few of you in there then. We'll, have a few, you know, we'll, we'll add a bit on the end of the course, or we'll have a few people who are like you know, token Marxist or token ecological economic, economist or whatever it is. But the core of it will remain the same. And I'm, I'm saying that's a bit like Henry VIII was when he, um, you know, when he rebelled against Rome. He basically did the bits that suited himself. But the core paradigm, you know, the, the actual paradigm of what economics is, was not changed. And this is why I think we need the Martin Luther move. We don't want the Henry VIII move. Sorry, I mean, I'm assuming people know a bit of history here. Apologies if you don't. We need to go for the paradigm itself. We need to say what's wrong with it, and we need a fundamental change to what's going on. Not a bit of tinkering, not sticking in a bit of development economics or a little bit of you know, um, alternative views or a little bit of a view from the South. We need to actually change the way the paradigm itself works. Only that is good enough, I think. Um, and just... Just to say, this, this came to me in another context, but I think it is interesting because it shows that the understanding of economics has changed radically in a certain direction and therefore, I think, can be changed. This is a quotation from the Academy of Management Review from 1979. It is unlikely that the trend towards industrial democracy and participative management is a passing fad, while also stating that rights to income, health and education will be seen as more important than property rights. Somebody seriously wrote that in a conventional management journal in 1979. The date is kind of not accidental, because that was obviously the same year that, that Margaret Thatcher was elected and economics started changing radically in the opposite direction. But that somebody could have said at that time that you know, we were seeing a trend towards industrial democracy, towards 
public and social ownership of capital and that that was expected to continue and was not a passing fad. I mean, I was alive at this time. It's extraordinary, isn't it? See how times have changed. But that does mean we can change ideas and, and put them into reverse um, over what is a relatively short time span, I would suggest. Just a, t a couple of examples of the kinds of things that might be included. Or oh, maybe I'll go on to the... Go on a couple of slides. No, I'll have to come back to it. Um, that, that might be included in, in economics texts and, and aren't. I mean, what we're trying to do in, in the book we're writing, and I'm, I'll talk about it a bit more later on, but we're actually trying to include a lot of different theories, a lot of different theorists, because um, one of the things you don't get, I think, in conventional economics teaching is a range of theories. You get a kind of uniform neoclassical theory, particularly in the first year courses, and that actually doesn't have very much relevance in explaining the problems we're facing. So after the crisis, everybody latched onto Minsky. You know, they said, oh, Minsky is explaining the instability in the financial system. You know, it didn't really take a genius to, to see this crisis coming. And a lot of people on my radical end of, of economics were precisely predicting that the increase in house prices, that the massive increase in house prices that was going on was going to result in a crash. But we weren't listened to, and when we said that, what was brought out against us was standard economic theory. But there were other theories of, of financial booms and busts out there, but because they weren't part of the standard understanding of economics, they were not attended to. And it's no good turning to Minsky, just as an example, it's no good to turning to him after the crisis. You know, students needed to know about him before the crisis. These kind of alternative theories of, of explanations of finance needed to be part of the toolkit before we got to the crisis. It's no good clearing up afterwards, except that we haven't cleared up afterwards. And, you know, in terms of my own interest, uh, uh, in terms of the environment and so on, I think really important contributions are made by Polanyi, to, uh, his ideas about, um, actually based on empirical research into how economies actually work and how most of human history has actually worked with people embedding their economic relationships in social and environmental relationships. That, I think, is crucial to improving the way our economy and environment and society interact with each other. And yet, that's also not being heard because Polanyi tends not to feature in economics teaching. He's taken up by sociologists and by geographers, but he was first and foremost an economist. And again, he's, he's somebody who we could very much benefit from in terms of alternative theory. This is something taken from um, the Royal Economic Society survey of what employers think economists need. I mean, of course, the pressure is coming from students because they don't like being taught what's just not a true view of the world. But another pressure is coming from employers of economists who say you're sending us people who don't have useful skills, apart from not having an accurate view of how the economy actually works. So kind of things they were suggesting needed changes were, were, were greater awareness of economic history and the current real world context. Hurrah, wendy has got those in there. Better practical data handling skills. I mean, we tend to teach modelling, but we tend not to teach the, the simple techniques of, of calculating indices and um, actually using maths in a practical way that might be relevant when you, when you come to be employed. Ability to communicate economics to non-specialists. I think we've all come across examples of, of failure of that. Um, more understanding of the limitations of modelling and current economic methodology, a more pluralistic approach to economics, although that again tends to mean <coughs> bringing in a few alternative views rather than changing the existing paradigm, <coughs> and a combination of deductive and inductive reasoning. So these are the things employers are expecting economists to have, and I would argue that our, way, our current way of teaching economics doesn't provide them. So just a little bit about the, the book that we've, we've written and sent off. It was, um, it was very difficult to do this, and uh, there are three of us involved. One is um, Jack Reardon, who's the editor of the International Journal of Pluralist Economics Teaching or something like that, and the other one is, is an economist based in, in South America. So we were very keen to have those alternative perspectives. Um, but, yeah, it did also lead to quite a lot of disagreements about what should be in there. But what we absolutely agreed on is that we have to start with the problem of a limited planet, limited resources, and therefore the idea of an economy, it being acceptable for an economy to carry on growing, was immediately problematic. So sustainability is key to the way we've written our text, and equity is also a central concern. So I think these are the three things that make it distinct from most textbooks, because you might get something about sustainability in a first-year text, 
but it's going to be one of those chapters at the end that you probably never get to, whereas we see it as absolutely central to what we're doing. Similarly, you know, you'll often get something about global poverty in chapter 39, um, or perhaps chapter 94, um, and you know, we, we think that's also central, and the perspective from the South is, is valuable as well, because of the very interesting policy changes that are being made in countries like Brazil, not just because of the importance ethically of including that perspective. So then we had this question, well, what should we include? And we decided that each chapter would include, so each subject that we look at will include one, of, one example from each of these um, aspects. So every chapter has something on history of economics. Every chapter has a specific theory. Um, and as I said, there might be a range of different theorists being brought in. Every chapter also has a, a practical technique that students can work through in, in the class that comes out of that chapter. Um, so that might be working out how cost-benefit analysis works as a technique. It isn't necessarily always a mathematical technique, but it, it always is something practical for students to do that they might actually do when they become working economists. And lastly, examples of things that are actually happening. So the debate around ecosystem services might be an example of that. So some, some current debate that's going on in the world, local currencies is another example of something we explore, um, you know, to, to give students an insight into contemporary developments, really. So in terms of how we teach this to our own students, I think that there's some questions that, that are still open. It would be good to have your views on this when we get to the, the discussion session. Um, so how much of the neoclassical liturgy, as I'm calling it here, do we still have to teach? Now, obviously, when I've started teaching this course, some of my colleagues are really distressed, and they say, well, you know, they have to know about the laws of supply and demand. They have to know. They did have three weeks, actually. One week they did this. One week they did this. The third week they did this. <coughs> the last course. I said, I, can't, I just can't teach that. Um, anyway, so, um, yeah, so how much of that... But you know, because when they go out into the world, they're working as economists. People are going to use these kind of little catchphrases. Economics has developed its own power and its own jargon. And so students do need to know those concepts, I think. But So this is something we're still discussing, how much of that needs to be included. We absolutely don't want to have a situation where we set up neoclassical economics and then we attack it. Um, but on the other hand, some of these concepts are important, I think, to somebody who's going to consider themselves an economist. Then we're very concerned about these concepts that kind of import a worldview as, you know, in their hand luggage, as it were. So the idea of economies of scale, I think, brings a particular view of, of how an economy works and implies certain things about economic organisation, which aren't necessarily universally true, but just by using that phrase, that kind of understanding is smuggled in. So I think we have to be very careful about those. We have to sort of pin those down and, and challenge them. But our students will need to understand them, I think. And then I have another category of concepts that I just think are very useful in helping you to understand the world. I mean, this is all subjective. This is me saying this. You, you, you know, you're perfectly free to disagree with me. But I, I, I think the idea of elasticity of demand, I can't find a problem with it. I think it's pretty neutral, and it's actually quite useful in terms of the kind of, you know, introducing taxation on cigarettes, no, people won't stop smoking, it will affect the poor. Those kind of arguments, I think, are still valid, and so some of the concepts are useful. So, anyway, this is a whole area that we we need to discuss and debate. But whether or not you decide to buy my textbook, uh, I think it's, you know, I, I think this is, this is the thing. Get rid of those toxic, te toxic textbooks. I don't want to think of any other students coming out as I did, well, actually throwing in economics because I thought they were all mad after three months, which is what happened to me the first time around. I wish Wendy had been teaching me then. That would have been so nice. I mean, when I learned economics, there was a couple of guys taught it. It was mostly about Robinson Crusoe, as I recall. And then by about week 10, they introduced another desert island and Linda Lovelace was on it. <laughs> anyway, you, you don't know who Linda Lovelace is, but she was sort of well-endowed female. And that was, you know, that was the way economics was taught. I don't think it's coincidental, incidentally, <laughs> that the three of us here are all women today. And, you know... Partly, it's a, partly there is a gender issue here, I think. But anyway, all I want to say in closing is that, you know, we, we don't want... To, this is a great book, Economics Anti-Textbook. I can really recommend if you haven't read that one before. But it's not a, it's not a teaching text, as you can't teach students in a sort of, well, here's, here's the paradigm, here's what's wrong with it kind of way. Um, and this, this book, book I also like. But I, I just want to say, you know, we need more resources. I'm, I'm glad that Wendy's e-book e will be there. I hope you'll have a look at my book or our book as well and you know let's have a plethora of alternative texts because that's what pluralist teaching is all about thank you